in this book of the Bible, and so we're going to start here again, and, um, and I'm going to review for about five minutes. If you weren't here, uh, these messages are online. You can go into the book of Colossians on our website, and they should be there. We also, I think, have the book of Philippians on there, the book of Galatians on there. There's a lot of stuff that you can go back through uh, for discipleship purposes. So let, let's, let's start. Um, and so about 100 miles south, southeast of Ephesus, which is on the Aegean Sea, in the, in the valley of the Lycus River, there once stood three very important cities, the city of Laodicea, Heropolis, and Colossae. And they're gonna put a map up for you. And so let me see how that looks. Yeah, so that, you, you can see where Ephesus is. And if you go over, there's Heropolis, uh, Laodicea, and Colossae. So this is ancient uh, Asia Minor, which is today modern day Turkey. This is where we're at. And so originally uh, they had been Phrygian cities, but now they were part of the Roman uh, province of Asia and they all stood within sight of each other. Um, Heropolis and Laodicea stood opposite sides of the valley on different sides of the river, about six miles apart and about 12 miles down. Um, Colossae straddled the river um, about, about uh, 12 miles further down. And um, so anyway, just an in incredible, uh, this region of the world was just, was just incredible. Um, and the Lycus River Valley, so they all were in the Lycus River Valley. And they, the Lycus River Valley had three very important characteristics. First of all, it was notorious for earthquakes. Laodicea had rebuilt itself two or three times because of earthquakes. And I don't know if there's fault lines in this area, uh, but earthquakes were, were just kind of common every, you know, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years. Um, and then the waters of the Lycus River, River and its tributaries as they would go out, they were filled with calcium. And if you were here two weeks ago, I showed you pictures of Heropolis. And if you go back to the lesson, there's pictures on there or you can Google Heropolis. And Heropolis, it's, it's actually, it's, it's under a volcano and they have natural hot springs that, that, that form there. And it, it looks, when you look at Heropolis, it looks like snow-capped mountains because all these calcium deposits have built just monuments and, and all kind of incredible things. And uh, then of course, this is a very wealthy reason. And for um, Colossae became, of these three cities, Colossae became what is known as the unimportant city. We don't, we don't know why, but as history goes by, Laodicea, a very, very prominent city, Heropolis, a very, very prominent city. You can go there today and, and they've, uh, they, archeologists have dug down and there's still portions of the cities that are there. Um, as far as Colossae, they don't, they're not even sure exactly where the site is, although, you know, I believe that we know, but it's not 100%, 100% sure. But we don't know why. We don't know why, what caused, um, you know, Colossae just to kind of disappear. And so this is very interesting. When Paul writes his letters, he's always writing to uh, capital cities, uh, to port cities. He's, he's going to, to visit and he's writing letters to churches in places where, there was a lot of travel going through. They were on a trade route. And, for, and so Colossae is the least important city that Paul wrote to. And um, that doesn't mean it's not important, but, but I just, I'm just trying to get, get a picture for you. This region had a very large Jewish population. Um, some, some Jews had been sent there, uh, you know, a number of years before and they prospered. So many of their friends came came there, um, you know, to, uh, to live there because they were prospering. And, um, but the church of Colossae was mostly Gentile. And we, we know that from some of the language in the letter. And so the reason that Paul writes uh, the letter to Colossae, he had never visited there. He had never been there personally. And we, we, we believe his, one of his ministers, Epaphras, was the one that started the church in Colossae. And, um, but he's writing this letter because a heresy begins to develop in the church. And, and um, Paul was always, when he, when he would go to start these churches, he'd write them letters and he was always addressing because many of the converts in the Christian churches were not raised in God-fearing families and it was so easy for heresy to start, to, to start come in. And, and if one church became full of heresy, that, that would spread. So he was always trying uh, to take care of that. And so the, the, the big question is, you know, what was the heresy at Colossae? We, we really 
don't know. We really can't say. As a matter of fact, in the theologian world, it's called the Colossian heresy. And uh, they, they debated on, on which one is it. And the, the deal is, is that in, in Colossians, Paul is addressing items and topics but he, he never says exactly what the heresy is. Um, and so all, all we can do is read the letter and see all the things that Paul lays out and then see if there is one of the you know, more popular heresies that, that fit that. And so here's what we know about the heresy as, as we go through the book. It was a heresy that attacked the total adequacy and supremacy of Christ. And, and Paul in the book of Colossians, like no other book, no, like no other letter he ever wrote, he lays a foundation for the total adequacy and supremacy of Christ. I mean, he is, he is just, he's confronting this heresy. It was a heresy that attacked Christ's role in creation. It was a heresy that denied the humanity of Jesus. You know, Christians, we believe that, that Jesus was all God and all man. And, and, and so they, this heresy did not believe that. They thought he was God, but he wasn't man. Uh, there seems to have been some type of an astrological element in the heresy. And then the heresy made much of the powers of demonic spirits. And, and really in first century, um, there were so, so many different religions and so many different aspects that um, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, believe there was a spirit behind everything, behind rivers, behind trees, behind rocks. Everything had a spirit. So what I, what I shared last week, and I, the, the closest thing that I can come to is I believe this was the Gnostic heresy. Now, the Gnostic heresy became much more prevalent and popular, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, but the elements are here. And, and um, so uh, Gnosticism really began with a basic assumption, assumption about matter. And again, when I say this, you may think, well, this is kind of ridiculous today in the 21st century, but Man, I don't know. Have you looked around? There's a lot of weird religions today. There's a lot of weird stuff going around, you know, and people that pull a little bit from Buddha and a little bit from Muslim and a little bit from Christianity and a little bit from New Age and they just kind of wrap it up in a ball and, and, and hand it to you. But first of all, um, Gnosticism, it believed that the spirit alone was good and that matter was essentially evil. Second, it believed that matter was eternal and, and that the, so that the universe was not created out of nothing. Christians, we believe that the universe was created out of nothing, that God created the elements to create, to create the earth. But Gnostics believe that, that matter was, um, it, it was eternal and that matter was evil. And so that's why they, they, they didn't believe that, that Jesus could have been involved in creation because if Jesus is holy, he would not have interacted with this evil matter. And I know it sounds crazy, but this is where they were, where they were at. So in the book of Colossians, of Colossians, Paul lays a foundation for the supremacy of Jesus Christ, that, that Jesus Christ is all God and all man, and he had a role in the creation of our world. So now if you'll open up your Bibles or look on the screen, we're going we're gonna to begin with the introduction, and we'll get through chapter, through verse 11 today. And so in a book of the Bible, what we're going to do is, is we're going to read a passage, a few verses, and we're going to break it down and read a few pass read a few more verses and, and break it down. And, and um, so hopefully we'll be done here. It's probably take another four, four or five weeks. It depends on how my partner, how fast, how fast she moves along. So Pastor Joanne's going to be helping us. So I told her, I told her, we've got to cover a certain amount of verses every week. We've got to cover a certain amount and you only have a certain amount of time. So uh, she assures me that she's good. Colossians 1 verse 1 through 2, it says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. So again, Paul had never actually been to Colossae. So he began, he began by making clear what his right was to write them a letter. I mean, if, you know, if I, you know, we started family life and if someone writes me a letter and like I don't know who they are and they've never been here, you know, that letter may be in the trash. Right, I'm probably not gonna get through line one or line two, you know. But the, the different, here's the difference was Epaphras, we, 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 I believe that Epaphras started the church. Epaphras is there working with, with the, the, the church in Colossae and Epaphras is a disciple of, of, of Paul. 
and he's one of Paul's spiritual sons. And so that's the connection. So he writes them by telling them, you know, that, that he's, he's an, he does it with one word. He says, I am an apostle. Of course, the word apostle is, in the Greek, is the word apostolos. And it literally means one who's sent out. And Paul, Paul says, my right to speak to you is that God has sent me to start churches. He sent me to plant churches. He sent me to raise up a team to go out and to minister to people and to build the church. And, and more than that, I, God has called me to be an ambassador to the Gentiles. And so he's, he's laying this out. And uh, he says, moreover, I, I'm an apostle by the will of God. And so uh, th think, think about this with me. So the office of, of the apostle is not something that Paul had earned or achieved. It was something that was given to him by the will of God. It's what God called him to do. Um, it, you know, John 15 and verse 16 says this. God says, look, Jesus said this. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. So right, out of, right on, at the outset of the letter, Paul, he's laying out the doctrine of grace. And, and here's the doctrine of grace. A man or a woman is not what he or she has made themselves to be. You and I, we're, we're, we're not, I'm not a pastor because uh, I did a certain amount of schooling or I did whatever I decided. I'm a, I'm a pastor because God called me to be a pastor. And, um, you know, but, but God has made him or her to be that. So again, our, the grace says this, is that our lives fall under a calling from God. And when we do the things that God has called us to do, his grace flows through us. You know, the gifts of the spirit, the, the word there is charis. It comes, they're grace gifts. They're not something that you can, people come to me and ask me, well, how can I develop my gifts? And sure, there's things are, there's things that you can do to develop your gift. If God hasn't called you to be a prophet, you're probably not going to be the best prophesier in the world. That's just the bottom line. We, we all don't have all the gifts, but we all can have some of the gifts at some of the times if they're needed. And so it's this idea of grace that God has called us to do certain things. And I'm always, I'm always perplexed. I'm going to share my heart with you. I'm always perplexed how people want to do something that God hasn't called them to do. It's the most amazing gift of humans in the world that we want to do something that we're not good at. You know, and when I was in Lafayette, there was this, this police officer, and he had, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a good a man of God, and he had cancer, and he was going to die, and God healed him of cancer. I mean, God, it was a supernatural miracle, and so he wanted to go around and start sharing that testimony. I'm like, man, that's a good thing, but he's like, but I don't, I don't want to talk. I want to sing. He said, yeah, God has called me into the music ministry to bless people. And I'm like, well, Okay, that's new. I've never heard him sing. I asked one of my friends. I'm like, well, can he sing? And my friend said, no, he can't sing a lick. He can't sing in a bucket, you know? Auto-tune can't help him. And, you know, so we're talking about this. And so I'm like, well, someone needs to tell him. <laughs> I wasn't the one that went on that conversation. But, you know, if your singing isn't a blessing to people, perhaps God hasn't called you to sing. It doesn't mean you're bad. You can go and speak. You can go encourage people. Maybe God is going to have you pray for other people to get healed. But I, I'm, I'm fascinated how we get fixated on one thing that God's grace in our lives isn't flowing through. And that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. Listen, we have to find out what God has called us to do. And then his grace and his mercy and his gifts are going to flow through us to help us to accomplish that. And so Paul's like, I'm not a, an apostle because I want it to be. God set me apart to be a, an apostle. I was on a Damascus road. I was, I was going to torment Christians and God got a hold of my life and he called me, uh, you know, to, to do this. So it's very, very important um, as Christians, we don't get to decide what we should do. Come on now, come on church. It's Wednesday night, we can have church tonight, right? And I'll say some of this stuff on Sunday. You know, Sunday's a little bit of a rough crowd sometimes, but anyway. I'm kidding. But we all have a calling that we're supposed to follow. And if we can find out what God has called us to do, and if we can do that, 
And it can be as simple as some people, they're just called to be encouragers. They just encourage people. They, they can encourage a rock to be excited. They're just good at encouraging. And so don't look at, don't look at how God has gifted other people. Ask God what he's called you to do. Because if we flow in that gifting, it's, it's just an incredible gift. Paul was called to be an apostle. And when you read his letters and his encouragement to the church, his prayer for the church, his instruction for the church, he was phenomenal at it because it's what God called him to do. And then uh, Paul introduces Timothy as our brother. This is very interesting. So Paul, I mean, you know, Timothy is probably his number two guy, his spiritual son, ends up pastoring the church in Ephesus, ends up, ends up giving his life in Ephesus. He's, he's, he's martyred in the streets there during, during a pagan ritual. He went out, to stop, went out there to stop all the fornication and lewdness, and he was, he was killed right there on the street. And, but isn't it funny? Think about this. Check your pride. Paul introduces himself as the apostle, and he introduces his spiritual son, Timothy, as our brother. So Paul, Timothy is not called the preacher, He's not called the teacher. He's not called the prophet. He's not called the administrator. He's called our brother. And what does a brother do? A brother has the ability to walk beside all types of people and just walk with them in the faith, to build them up, to encourage each other. I tell you what, we need more brothers and sisters than we do pastors and prophets. As, as, a, as a matter of fact, in my job as a pastor, what did Paul, t what, what did Paul tell Timothy and Titus and first and second Timothy and Titus he's like listen you treat older men as brothers you know you you have to have the ability you know you you only get so far from speaking from right here you got to walk with people and in in Timothy you know it, a brother is someone who has the ability to establish authentic relationships and to walk with people through difficult times. Proverbs 18, 24, it says this, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. I tell you, you ought to check your friends. You probably need to lose some. You know, you need good people associated. So, so someone that has unreliable friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Another interesting and significant fact here in this opening address is that Paul, this is what he says to the, to the people in Colossae, how he opens his letter, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is very interesting because uh, when, when in Paul's earlier letters, the ones to First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Corinthians, and the Galatians, those are his earliest letters. He always opened up the address to the church, to the church in Thessalonica, to the church in Corinth, to the church, to the churches in the region of Galatia. That's how he did it. When he, when he gets later, when he comes to Romans, some people some people don't think. Paul wrote the book of Romans, I do. So if you look at Romans, Colossians, Philippians, and Ephesians, Paul changes his address, the way he opens up the address. He goes from addressing the church in the district to addressing individuals. And this is significant because I believe that as Paul is getting older, as he's getting wiser, as God is still revealing things to him, all of a sudden Paul begins to realize, look, I've been focused on the, on the church, right? The, the church. But the church is made up of people. The church is made up of individuals. Yes, the church proper is important. But if the people, if the men, the women, the children, if the marriages, if the relationships, if the church members, if the individual members aren't healthy, you're not going to have a healthy church. Well, you know, what are the heights to which family life can, can get to. What is, what, is, what, what is the health meter that family life can get to? It's when our people continue to grow and their marriages grow and their relationships with their sons and their daughters, they grow and their relationships with Jesus get, begin to grow and their finances begin to get in order. And when they begin to submit their lives to Jesus and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that's when uh, the church becomes the, the, the strongest. You know, the, the opening greeting, it closes um, here with probably the most significant placing of two things side by side. And I want you, 
L listen to this. It says, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want you to think about this. Every, every day, you know, what, what is Paul saying? That everyday Christians, we walk in two dimensions. And that's what makes living for Jesus and living uh, a Christian life difficult. Every day we're in two dimensions. We're in the world. You know, he said, he said in Colossae, we're in Sugar Land. We're in the greater Houston area. We are in a place physically and that, you know, our lives in the physical realm, they require effort. Right? I mean, we have to go to work. We have to take care of our kids. We have to fix cars. We have to fix houses. We have problems here and there. And so you're, you're in the world. But the second dimension is that we're in Christ. And if we remember that we're in Christ, it will help our in Houston, in Sugar Land, in the greater Houston area. It will help that go better. But there's a hard balance. And I think this is one of the hard balances is that, you know, I, I talk to people all the time. Since COVID started, I talk to people all the time and they just don't go to church anymore. Why, why don't you go to church anymore? Well, we're, we're just busy. See, they forget that they're supposed to be in Christ. You're not supposed to be, be just in at your job, at your family, in Sugarland, travel. You're supposed to be in this world that's a dimension, but you're also supposed to be in Christ, which means we also have spiritual res res responsibilities. So think about this. Our, if a lot, of time, a lot of times we get, you know why depression comes? And, I, and listen, I understand there's chemical imbalances in bodies and I'm not making light of that at all. It's a serious situation. But the majority of people that I talk with that are depressed, they're depressed because they forget that they're in Christ and they're just looking at their circumstances in the world. Hey, we need to grow up. <laughs> That's a lack of maturity. A lot of the problems, listen, a lot of the problems we face as Christians, if we were just more mature, we wouldn't face those problems. We would outgrow those problems. We would overcome those problems. I don't have anything else for you. This is all we got. Colossians 1, verse 3 through 8. Let's go to the, the next section. It says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. So Paul's, He's praying for the churches because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that, that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven about which you have, you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned, you learned it from Epaphras, our, fellow, our, fellow, our dear fellow servant, who is, faith, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. So here, here we're presented with, with the... With the um, with the essence of the Christian life. And so I'm gonna give you the essence of Christian life right now. I'm gonna give you the two things you have to have to be an authentic Christian. There's two things that you have to have if you're gonna have a growing relationship and if your spiritual life is, is, is gonna blossom. Uh, Paul says he's, he's delighted because he is told, Epaphras says he told Paul that the Colossians are demonstrating uh, two great qualities in their spiritual lives. First of all, it's faith in Christ and love for the people. And, and that's what we have to have. We have to have ultimate, ultimate faith in Christ. But if we have faith in Christ and we don't love people, what good is our faith? Your faith only benefits you. And so the, the, these two things, and, and what I wanna say is, this is, ama this is amazing. When I, read, when I read this letter, which was written, you know, almost 2,000 years ago, and when you, when you just look at it and you're like, well, how is something that was written so long ago, how is that going to affect me today? And, and it's in every way because th this, these essential elements that Paul is laying out for the Colossian church, there's still a problem in our churches today. This is still a problem balancing 
Faith in Christ and love for people. That is a genuine problem that we have in churches today. And, and so here's how, some churches, they have faith in God, but no one is welcome to come. I mean, if you're, if you're not up to their level, it's kind of like going to church with the Pharisees and Sadducees, man. It's like they're legalistic and all this stuff. Then other churches, here, here's the other side that we're, we've become guilty of. We love people so much that we compromise God's word. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. That's real. You, I cannot, sometimes I know y- y'all think I'm exaggerating, so you can ask Tracy this. Every time I preach on social issues, every time people leave the church, every time, every time. And what happens is, it, you know, and it's not like I go hardcore. I mean, look. The Bible calls sin, sin. And we're all sinners. We have all been guilty of sin. It doesn't matter if, if you're into one, if you, have, you struggle with one sin and someone struggles with a different sin. And so when I lay out God's word, God's word, this is God's word. To the, this is the gospel today that listen, God loves all of us. And he forgives all of us. But there are certain lifestyles or certain activities or certain behaviors or certain attitudes. It's just sin. I mean, that's just, and so here, here's how it happens. If, if it, you know, basically if I talk about sexual sins, I'm like, look, any type of sex outside of marriage, if you're, if you're, if you're not married and you're living together and you're having sex, that's fornication. If you're married and you have a, an affair outside, that's adultery. Uh, if it's same-sex marriage, you know, that all, all of that is a sin, okay? All of that is a sin. But if I say that, what happens is people come back to me and they're mad at me, and, but the reason they're mad is because they have a family member who's living in a lifestyle, okay? And what I say to them, look, some of the people I love don't know Jesus. Some, some of my family members, you know, they're not living right in it doesn't matter if they're my family member. It, it's just sin. And God loves them and he wants them to repent and he wants them to know him. Part of my job is to pray for them and try to reach out to them. But just because someone I love is living in sin, that do, I don't have the authority or the power to change God's word, but that's what we do. That's exactly what, what people do today. Well, if you just don't accept people, you don't, no, we love everybody. But not everyone's getting to heaven. I mean, we, we love everybody. We have people that come to this church and when they first started coming, they were struggling with homosexuality. They were struggling with all types of addictions. They were lit. We have people coming to the church that live together. And they're welcome and we're glad they come. But at some point, we got to make a decision because right is right and wrong is wrong. But some people come and they're not looking to get saved. They're just curious, right? And the church, so that's the balance. We can have faith in God. We, that can be resolute, with unwavering, and we can also love people who are not yet where they should be or we want them to be. I mean, those two things, those are, aren't, it's not one or the other. Both of those, uh, you know, can exist. And so then, then he talks about here the, the essence of the gospel. He starts talking about the, the true gospel, He says, you have heard the true message of the gospel that has come to you. And in the same way, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. So l- l- let's talk about what the, the essence of the gospel. Um, there's about five or six things here that Paul lays out to the church at Colossae that really tells what the gospel is. First of all, number one, is the gospel is just good news. It's the good news of God. It's a message of God. It's a message of a God who's a friend and lover of the souls of men. And first and foremost, the gospel sets us in a right relationship with God. So that's, that's the first thing, that the gospel is good news. The gospel isn't, see, the gospel isn't you can't do this, this, this. That's not the gospel. Those are standards of Christian living. The gospel is that God loved us so much that he sent his son into the world to pay for our redemption. That's the gospel. And if you understand how much God loves you, see, I, you know, 
I, I think love does a better job of bringing people to the kingdom than trying to beat them up. I mean, gosh, we already know, we are, I mean, come on, we already know that uh, we have issues, right? The second of all is that the gospel is truth. So all previous religions could be entitled guesses about God. But the gospel brought certainty about God. That's, that's the difference. Number three, the gospel is universal. And so it is for all the world. And, and, and again, if there are so many, you know, so, so many of the world religions today, they're for a certain group of people. And that's what the religious leaders were trying to make it. And that's why Jesus is so mad because the gospel is universal. Uh, it's not, it's not um, confined to any one race or nation, nor, nor to any one class or conditions. You know, very few things in this world are open to all people. Let me give you an illustration. Um, a person's intellect decides what they can study in education. That's true. You can't study everything. I, I mean, I had some friends that were like super smart. They were super, they were like mathematicians and like I, they went out and got their PhDs in math. I couldn't do that. I just wanted to pass college algebra, okay? Because it was a requirement to get my degree. That's all I want to do, okay? And, and a funny story in high school, I had this friend and he's just, he's just a genius. And every day my senior year, I played him in chess and I never beat him. Again, I'm not the smartest, but I'm determined, right? And every day I would go there and I would say, today is the day that you would fall. But, and he would be doing, reading a book and playing me chess and still be, it was, it was, I mean, how prideful can you be, you know? But today he's making a lot of money. He's way a mathematician. Um, so a person's social status determines the circles they can interact with. This is true. There's some groups and circles I'm not allowed to be in because I don't have enough money. Right? I mean, that's true for all of us. A person's wealth determines the possessions they can accumulate. Sure, you can, you can borrow a certain amount of money, but I mean, you can't go, we can't go buy a yacht like Jeff, Jeff Bezos. You see that a couple weeks ago, he built a yacht and they built it by a waterway, but he couldn't get out to the ocean because there was a bridge, there was a bridge that wasn't high enough for his yacht to fit under. And I, I, mean, I, I could be wrong, but I believe he was trying to buy them a new bridge. Tear that one down so I can get my yacht out and I'll build you a new bridge. So, I mean, I can't do that, okay? I can't do that and it's just the way it is. But the message of the gospel is open to all of humanity without exception. It doesn't matter if you're homeless. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you have a disease. It doesn't matter. The gospel is for everyone. And to be quite frank with you, in places around the world that the gospel is just blowing up. It's in the poorest, most persecuted regions of the world. I mean, it, you, just, you can't oppress the gospel. It, it spreads like wildfire. Number four is that the gospel is productive. It's, the gospel bears fruit and increases. And, and so it, it's, it's the plain fact of history and experience that the gospel has the power to change individual men and society in which men live in. A lot, of, a lot of, I've talked to a lot of people and, and most people don't have the opportunity to travel around the world. I'm blessed, I've had the opportunity. And here's what most people don't understand is most, in most of the parts of the world where there's shortages, where there's not enough food, there's not, it, it could be, that could be eliminated if they change the way they lived. And here, here's what I mean. If, you know, if you, live, if you live in a region of the world that believes in reincarnation, they don't kill any animals, they don't, they don't, they don't kill any, any, like, they don't spray pesticides, they don't do any of that stuff, they don't kill rats because that could be, and I'm not trying to be funny, but that could be Uncle Sam. I mean, that, that's the real, well, these, thi these th things, are not, they're not, they can't kill because of re they believe in reincarnation or eating all their crops. So if you believe in Jesus, then you, maybe, I, maybe the, I'm being, I'm not trying to be funny, but in most regions of the world, as a matter of fact, we have a man in our church that has a Bible college around the world and in all the places where they bring, where they bring the kingdom of God, the, the society is transformed and their, their, their standard of living goes up. 
But why? Because a lot of times it's the way that we think and act that keep us, in, 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 at least people in different parts of the world, impoverished. Um, anyway, I, and if, if that bothered anyone, I'll be glad if you did come into my office and I can give you example after example. Uh, you know, I wasn't trying to be flint, but I was being very serious about that. Number five is the gospel tells of grace. And the gospel is not a message of demands, but a message, but it's a message of the hope it offers. And number six, which brings us to us, the gospel is humanly trans, transmitted. And, you know, 2 Corinthians says that God has called us to be his ambassadors. And, and we, I tell you what, we need to do a better job of sharing the love of Jesus. We, we have become so busy in America that we don't have time for simple conversations. I mean, I know people that they don't know their neighbors. Been living in their neighborhood for five years, 10 years, they don't know their neighbors. And again, we're so busy that we don't have time for relationships or for sharing the gospel. We'll do one more section tonight. Uh, Colossians 1 verse 9 through 11, it says this, for this reason, since the day we heard about you. Again, this is Paul saying, I haven't met you, but from the day that we heard about your faith in Christ, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. So this is a precious thing. You know, it's a precious thing. To me, it's a precious thing when you hear one brother or sister in Christ praying for someone else. You know what we're guilty of in America? We're guilty of talking bad about people. We're guilty of gossiping about people. If we're gonna be charged, we should be charged with praying for them. Come on now. It's almost like sometimes people feel good if someone else is doing better than them. Listen, that, that's, that's a very short-sighted view of the gospel. The gospel I read, God can bless everybody. Just because someone else is blessed, God, that doesn't mean God doesn't have enough blessings for you, okay? But it's a precious thing that Paul, the apostle, who has never been to Colossae, who has never met these people, cares enough to write them this really a doctrinal statement about how to live, what's important, this is how you need to live the Christian life. And he, he's saying you know, I haven't stopped praying for you. It's kind of like parents. You just don't stop praying for your kids. Well, how are your kids doing? Well, they're good. They're 30. They're married. They have kids, but they're still in your heart. You still, you, you never stop praying, uh, you know, for your kids. It's funny when I talk to my dad sometime and he's like, how are you doing? I'm worried about you. Well, why are you worried about me? Because he's my dad. It doesn't matter if I'm 35. He's still my dad. So it's a precious thing to hear people. Don't we need more of that in the church today? Praying for people, praying for our teenagers, praying for our children, praying for our marriages, praying for the fine. Just, just begin to just praying for people. So Paul is praying for, the, for his Colossian friends whom he's never formally met. And he, make, he makes, this is one thing you can learn from Paul. You can not only learn that you need to pray for people. But if you go through his letters, there are specific prayers of how to pray for people that are very, very powerful. Paul makes two specific requests for them. First of all, he asks for discernment of God's will. And then he asks for the power to perform God's will in their life. Think about this. You know, without, without question, when, when I talked earlier about we have to flow and we have to operate in the grace areas that God has given us. That's where we're going to flourish in. The problem is a lot of people don't know what they're supposed to do. And so Paul is praying that they will know, have a deeper understanding of God's will for their life. And that, that's number one, understanding what God's will is for their life. And a lot of things we don't have to understand what God's will. I can tell you right now, it's God's will. It is God's will. 
uh, for you to be the best husband, the best wife you can. It's God's will for you to support local churches. God's will for you to put him first in your finances. It's God's will for you to set a godly example for your children. It's God's will to express love and compassion to people. Yes, we know all that. But specifically, what, you know, what is, is there something that God wants me to do? Uh, for example, our missionary, our missionary to Vietnam, uh, Terry and Ty Hensley, you know, he's 73. They haven't been able to go to, to Vietnam and they're leaving here in a few months. They'll be gone for four months. Then they're gonna come back and then they're gonna go again in January, doing inc- really, really an incredible work. Well, you know, the first part of Terry's life, and, and I don't think he would mind me sharing this, you know, he wasn't saved and he just messed up. He got saved later in life. God called him to be a missionary to Vietnam at 67 years old. Come on now. That should get us excited. We don't, I mean, we're never gonna get to the place in life when, okay, I mean, if you get to the place where God's done with you, you're not gonna be here anymore, right? So if we're here, we need to figure out what do you want me to do? And and when I talk to him, we talk about Vietnam, he just lights up. Like he's 30 years old or something, you know? I mean, I should have said a teenager, right? But anyway, like he's a, yeah, he lights up like he's a teenager. Why? Because he found what God wants him to do, what God is calling him to do in this season of his life. But here's the next thing. After you find out, so Paul just didn't pray that they would, they would come to understand God's will for them. He also prayed that they would have the power to follow that will. It's one thing to know what God wants you to do. Sometimes it's quite another to live that out and follow that out. Well, that's where the rubber meets the road. And you know, sometimes God asks you to do something. I mean, God asked me to come here and start this church. He gave me some specific things we need to do. Well, we, we've been going 24 years this year. And so, and, 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 and so hopefully, hopefully I get another 24. I don't, I don't know. But the whole point is this, is that you know, you need to know what God's will is. Then you need to have the power to, to live that out. And he gives two words. I pray that you may have great endurance and patience. Endurance and patience. What is endurance? Endurance is really talking, the term there is stamina. Like if you're going to go run, run a, a, you know, a 5K race, you need the stamina. You want, I want to run the whole thing or Run may be a funny term. I want to keep moving, right? And some people don't make it, but the stamina. So we have to have the the endurance, the stamina to carry out God's will, but we also need the patience to carry out God's will. And I'm telling you, most of us, myself included, are not very patient. And so what happens if you're not patient? You're always thinking that God should be working faster than he is, You're always thinking that you should see more fruit than you have. Again, it's the American dream that this, you know, this is what we should see. Patience just says, I'm just going to continue. I'm not going to get discouraged. I'm not going to get depressed. I'm just going to keep doing what God has asked me to do regardless of what what I see. I'll tell you a great example, example in the Bible is the prophet Jeremiah. He's called the weeping prophet because he was always crying. I mean, you read his life, not, I mean, he's thrown in a well. They, they sent him off to Egypt. I mean, his life, in terms of a prophet, it didn't seem like he was too successful. But you know what he did? Every time God called him to declare a word to the nation of Israel or to a king, he did it. He did it. He suffered for that, but, but he did it. So again, when we find God's will, we need the power to carry it out. And listen, don't be discouraged if things don't look how you thought they would look. Just, just, just make sure you're doing what God asks you to do. See, all we're supposed to do is carry out God's will for our life. We're not responsible for the results. I mean, when I quit pastoring family life, my job is to do the best I could do with as much integrity and character and and to work as hard as I could to pastor people. How large family life is when I hand it to someone else? How many people have gotten saved through our missions organizations that we support? You know, that's not my business. That's God's business. 
My job is to be faithful, is to, is to run, is to run um, the race that he's called me to run with great endurance and patience. We can all do that. So don't be worried. Don't compare yourself to other people. You know, I mean, I, just, let's just get out of all this and let, let's get, we, we live in this area, but we live in Christ. Let's live in Christ. Let's figure out what his plan is for our life and let's run that, that race with great patience and endurance. Would you stand with me? How about Jasmine and Goomer come? And I thought while we, what we close with worship tonight, um, we'll just open up the altars for prayer if, if someone needs prayer for anything or, or even, even if you want to come and kneel at the altar and just, just pray and ask God for wisdom and direction. God, we're so thankful for the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. Lord, it was, it was a church of Gentiles. It, it, was, it was a church that Paul hadn't even been to, yet he cared enough for them even though it wasn't an important capital city, Lord, he cared for this church and, and we see his love for them. We see his care for them. We see him praying for them. We see his careful instruction uh, to the church at Colossae. And Lord God, we ask tonight that these principles that Paul was sharing with the church at Colossae, Lord, that they would encourage us in our lives today, Lord God, that we would be able to run the race you set before us with great, endurance and patience in Jesus name we pray amen so I'll just be up here Pastor Joanna come up and we'll be happy to pray for anyone who needs prayer or if you just want to come up and just kneel down that's okay too